Well, thank you for having me here today. All right. Um, I have actually two discrete, which is to say separate items on this afternoon's agenda. The two discrete items are to speak about the situation in Gaza as it's unfolded the past decade, but then two new items, which I consider a separate aspect, have crept into the agenda. Uh, George Corey, who has the virtue of being candid in his presentation, uh, he warned me, he alerted me, that uh, there are many people here who are disturbed by my alleged uh, opinions on BDS, and I should uh, address that question while I'm here. Uh, and I do feel there is a responsibility. Uh, actually, just as I was talking to George Curry about that, and he can attest to it at exactly the same moment, I received an email from Alice Walker, who some of you know as the author of The Color Purple, and I had spent some time with her in San Francisco, and uh, she, she's less uh, um, bold than George Curry, and she didn't mention anything about BDS, but when I received the email after spending the day with her, she wrote, and by the way, what is your opinion on BDS and why do you oppose it? And it's something that's obviously trailed me uh, and has caused me a certain amount of, I wouldn't call it grief, I would call it more in the order of disappointment and not in the order of personal disappointment. It's simply a fact that I have spent the entire, my entire adult life mastering the details of this conflict. I can say without fear of idle boasting that I feel I have a contribution to make, and that contribution has been significantly diminished uh, by a dearth of invitations to speak, and those, that lack of invitations is not only due to my adversaries, but the fact that most of these people who characterize themselves as militants in support of Palestine have also uh, seen fit to not invite me to speak. And as I said, I don't take it as a personal insult or a personal offense because I never entered the Palestine conflict uh, uh, in search of popularity. Uh, when I first involved myself in 1982, when Israel invaded Lebanon, it was anything but a popular cause. Now it's quite different. Now it's kind of chic on college campuses, but it certainly wasn't back then. And um, so it's never been an issue of popularity to me, but it's an issue of politics. And if you have prepared yourself, armed yourself, for the moment of truth, and then the moment of truth arrives and you discover that you have been rendered uh, useless, that's a disappointment. And then the second issue is the question of what's going on now, and that I think it's actually, we're at a critical moment with regard to Gaza, but I think we're headed towards a disaster, uh, a disaster which just doesn't have to be. And I want to discuss why I think we're at a critical moment, but I think a moment that's going to end in tremendous disappointment. And it doesn't have to be. And that's the frustration. Uh, but anybody who's involved in the Israel-Palestine conflict knows that it's replete with disappointment. It's replete with opportunities which have been lost and uh, the current round is supposed to endure for six weeks, and one can only hope and pray, and we'll discuss this at some length, that the leadership in Gaza can, uh, uh, can undertake a course correction so as to make the sacrifice of life, which is going to be um, not trivial, 
at least produce some result. Uh, and we need to talk about that, and time is short because it's just six weeks. It's supposed to be current round of demonstrations is supposed to culminate on May 14th, uh, which all of you know the significance of, so I need not detain you on that. Okay, with that by way of introduction, uh, let's begin. I'll try to speak for approximately one hour, and I'm going to watch the clock carefully, and then I want to leave at least uh, a half hour uh, 15 minutes for the BDS issue where everybody can air out their grievances with me <laughs> and I can try to uh, not necessarily persuade you that my position is correct, but at least enlighten, to you, enlighten you as to what I do believe on the topic and then leave at least 15 minutes on what's going on now and why I think we're in desperate need of a course correction if, we're going, if anything is going to come of what surely will be a massive loss of life, which only began yesterday, but will only escalate as time passes. I'm going to speak on Gaza this afternoon, and uh, I'll be speaking on a pretty narrow, but I think illuminating topic, namely the way human rights organizations have covered Gaza uh, over time and the fact that, uh, as was revealed in Operation Protective Edge in July-August 2014, the human rights organizations finally capitulated to the Israeli juggernaut and have completely betrayed Gaza in particular and their formal mission in general. But before I get to that, which as I said, a narrow but nonetheless, in my opinion, it's an illuminating topic. Before I get to that, I want to just put Gaza in context. Most of you know the bigger picture, but some of you might not. And unless you understand the bigger picture, you can't possibly understand the urgency of the situation. So let's look at the bigger picture. Number one, Gaza is among the most densely populated places on Earth. It's more densely populated than, say, Tokyo. Number two, Gaza is an overwhelmingly refugee population. It's about 70% refugees, which is to say about 70% of Gaza's population was expelled in 1948 under the UN classification system descendants of refugees also are classified as refugees. So under the formal classification, uh, Gaza's population is 70% refugees. Fact number three, Gaza's population is majority children. 51% uh, of Gaza's population is under the age of 18 years old. So when you, want, when you think about Gaza, when you see it in your mind's eye, you shouldn't be seeing uh, an image of me in your mind's eye, and you shouldn't be seeing an image of, or at least in majority, you should be seeing an image, if you don't mind, I don't know your name, I forgot it. Yara. Excuse me? Yara. Yara, if you don't mind standing up. No, it's important to bear in mind. Uh, Laura is in ninth grade. And that's Gaza in its majority. It's 51% children, and you have to bear that in mind. You have to not just bear it in mind, you have to fix it in your mind. Uh, number four, uh, Gaza has been under an occupation for 50 years. In the case of Gaza, it's been a particularly brutal occupation uh, because the major rounds of resistance occurred in Gaza, whether it was right after Israel occupied it in 1967, and that culminated in the first major round of repression to the Gazan resistance around 1970, which was presided over by Ariel Sharon. Most of you will, no, most of you will perhaps not know or not remember, 
about the First Intifada, 1987, December 7th, 1987. It began in Gaza. So a brutal occupation, and then the brutal occupation beginning in its early, its incipient phase began around 1991 with Israel's imposition of what was called the closure, which prohibited Gazans from traveling, say, to the West Bank. And gradually, over time, Israel turned the screws more and more until the uh, siege of Gaza, the blockade of Gaza, it began roughly in mid-2007. Uh, its main culmination, or one of its culminations, came in January 2006, when Hamas won the first democratic elections ever held in the Arab world, uh, and the reaction of Israel, followed soon by the US and the EU, was to tighten the screws of Gaza's blockade to punish it for carrying out, executing uh, democratic elections. And then that phase of the blockade uh, reached its climax in 2007, when the US, along with Israel and elements of the Palestinian Authority, attempted a coup to overthrow the legally elected government. And Hamas then consolidated its control of Gaza and the blockade then entered into its most brutal phase, a blockade that continues as we speak. Uh, and the last fact I would want to just uh, situate Gaza within, or context within, within which I would want to situate Gaza, uh, there has been this occupation compounded by the blockade, the illegal, immoral, criminal blockade, this medieval siege of Gaza. Um, and that siege, that blockade, has been periodically uh, punctured by Israel's, uh, what they call operations, but which are, in layperson's terms, Israel's massacres in Gaza. And the last of those major massacres, occurring again within the context of the medieval siege, the last of the major massacres of Gaza occurred during Operation Protective Edge in 2014, July, August. It lasted 51 days from July 7, 2014 until August 26, 2014. And it's very easy, and I can't say I'm immune to the tendency or immune to the temptation. There's a kind of, it's a, there's a kind of tendency now because of the, um, because of the um, um, humanitarian crisis which have swept the entire uh, Arab Muslim world, uh, whether it be Syria, Afghanistan, Yemen, um, Iraq, Bahrain, and then uh, even outside the Arab Muslim world, the crisis in the southern Sudan among the Rohingya, it's, there's a, almost a natural impulse to say that the suffering among Palestinians and even among Gazans, it kind of pales by comparison. And uh, if the salience of the Palestine struggle has been significantly diminished in the last three years, the normal assumption is if it's been diminished in the last three years, uh, in part it's because next to the other humanitarian crises, Gaza or Palestine just doesn't seem to loom that large. And uh, as, uh, but then you sometimes have what I might call a reality check. And the reality check uh, came to me not in the form of numbers, uh, not in the form of statistics, but it came in the form of a personal witness. 
and the personal witness in this case was the, is the head of the International Committee of the Red Cross, a person by the name of Peter Maurer, M-A-U-R-E-R. Uh, Maurer is by job description, his job is to visit war zones, to visit combat zones. And so if you Google, as I did, Peter Maurer, Afghanistan, he was there. Peter Moore, Syria, he was there. Peter Moore, Iraq, he was there. Peter Moore, Central African Republic, he was there. Uh, he's been to all the war zones. And um, yet, nonetheless, notwithstanding, after, uh, in 2014, he went to Gaza after the last Israeli, major Israeli operation. And he then made the statement, and I'm quoting him verbatim. He said, I've never seen such massive destruction ever before. I've never seen such massive destruction ever before. Well, that's a kind of sobering statement. When you bear in mind the war zones he's visited, we all know we all have vivid images, if only from the nightly news, of the massive destruction in Syria. And we have vivid images of the massive destruction in Iraq, Afghanistan, and so forth. And yet he stepped out of Gaza after uh, bearing witness there, and he says, I've never seen such massive destruction ever before. And that brings us up to the present. And the present is the most foreboding moment of all because of one of the uh, unique characteristics of Gaza. I always hesitate to use the word unique uh, because it then becomes an unseemly game of competitive suffering who has suffered more, and nobody really wants to go down that path. It's, very, it's impossible to measure suffering. Uh, Plato says in one of his dialogues, the Gorgias, he says, between two unhappy people, it's impossible to say which person is unhappier than the other, because for each person, it's a state of unhappiness. And so how can you measure which is worse and which is better? They're both unhappy. So nobody really wants to travel down that path of competitive suffering uh, in the context of the Nazi Holocaust. Uh, there was a, a historian who since passed from the scene named Peter Novick, and he referred to the Jewish insistence on the uniqueness of the suffering of Jews during the Nazi Holocaust. And then along come the Armenians who say ours was worse, and African Americans in the Middle Passage who say no, ours was worse. Uh, and he called it a Holocaust sweepstakes. And nobody wants to get involved in that. So rather than speak of unique characteristic, I'll just call it different. Uh, the United Nations Relief and Works Agency, UNRWA, which is the main humanitarian organization in Gaza. And they made a statement a couple of years ago, which is worth bearing in mind. They said there is something different about the situation in Gaza from anywhere else in the world. They said, in the situations where you have natural disasters, say a drought, or you have human-made disasters like war in Syria, uh, the population uh, who is on the receiving end or amidst these disasters, the population always has the option of leaving. Now, that's not a happy op option, as many people in this room can tell you from life experience, because leaving effectively means you become a refugee. And even in its early transient, temper hopefully transient, temporary and provisional state, 
it means at best you're going to get a, um, a um, some sort of uh, makeshift shelter, and at worst you're going to be in mud uh, trying to survive. So I'm not recommending, let alone singing the praises of that option, but it is a last recourse, a last resort option. But said UNRWA, Palestinians are in a unique, or let's just call it a different situation. They don't have that option. They can't leave. And that sounds awful enough, but then you have to put it in the context of exactly what they can't leave from. And here we can refer to the major United Nations uh, relief and um, uh, professional agencies, whether it be the World Bank, uh, or whether it be the uh, UNRWA, or many other organizations. And since 2012, they've been periodically putting out reports under the interrogative, not the declarative, under the interrogative, will Gaza be livable in 2020? Will Gaza be livable in 2020? Now, that's not poetry. That's not literary license. These are very responsible, uh, professional, tend to be conservative organizations, and they're speaking to a medical, physical fact. Will Gaza be livable? And at the beginning, they were speculating, well, unless significant changes aren't made, it probably won't be livable. And now, as time has elapsed from 2012 to the present, these human rights, not only human rights, uh, these economic agencies and relief agencies, they have revised their forecast. They're now saying we were too optimistic. Uh, it's not 2020. It'll be considerably sooner. And as some of you, or maybe a majority of you know, that moment has rapidly, uh, is now upon us. 97% of the drinking water in Gaza is now unfit for human consumption. That's the nice way of saying, if there is a nice way of saying, that's the nice way of saying that each day, a parent has to face the prospect that each time his or her child uh, drinks water, the child is being poisoned to death. Uh, that's a pretty aggressive, incendiary statement, because the bottom line is, and I know Israel's supporters will not be happy to hear it, but it is a biological medical fact that because of Israel's siege of Gaza, one million children are being daily poisoned uh, there. Uh, I was careful about the choice of my words because that does evoke a very angry response from those who prefer to reside in a zone of denial, uh, but it's nonetheless a fact. Uh, Sarah Roy, who some of you might know as the world's leading authority on Gaza's economy, uh, she recently produced a new edition of her standard book on Gaza's economy, and it includes a new preface, a new introduction. And she says that parents are now in the very unfortunate situation of having to watch helpless as their children are being poisoned to death. Well, that's one half of the picture. The other half is they can't leave. And then you have to, in your own imaginations, because I don't want to... 
you to rely on my own authority. If you put the facts together, a population of 2 million people, about 51%, about 1 million of whom are children, are caged into an area, locked into an enclosure that they can't leave and which is rapidly, if not we've already reached the point, at least in terms of water, is unlivable. As the dictionary definition uh, describes the word unlivable, it's physically, biologically unlivable. And there's a population that is confined there and can't leave. Then you search your moral, uh, you search your own moral vocabulary and come up with the right word to describe that kind of situation. Uh, and then you ponder the meaning of applying that word to that situation. Okay, that's the context. Uh, I won't review all of that. I think it's sunk in uh, the context of Gaza. Uh, 